Today we're going to talk about the next generation of developer first products. My name is Zeno Rocha. I'm the VP of developer experience at WorkOS and I'm super excited to be here with you all today. Now, before we start talking about the next generation of developer first products, it's important that we understand what is happening right now in front of us. This whole movement around companies that are focused on that developer persona. Now, when it comes to decision making for technology purchases, developers, they only use to influence, but not necessarily authorize these purchases, but that's no longer the case. And this is really, really important. Uh, there's data from uh, Evans Data Corporation where they interviewed tons of developers and they found that 58% of them said that they have budget authority and not only budget influence. And this changes the whole game. Developers being able to choose the tools that they are now going to invest within engineering is really crucial uh, when it comes to uh, the power dynamics within uh, the market. And the number of developers keeps growing and growing, right? Uh, it's not like this is slowing down uh, at all. Like the growth in terms of people that are qualified in the market um, is also substantial. Like the, the US still has the largest population of developers, but India, uh, uh, like they predict that India is going to overtake the US by 2024. APAC keeps growing like crazy and it shows the, the strongest growth and LATAM is the, the second strongest growth. So the whole market is uh, growing and the what we used to see uh, in terms of like you, like adopting a new tool is that it, it's typically like a top-down approach where management comes in and say, hey, we're going to use this tool. And then the developer is just like the, the, the one that is responsible for executing that tool and integrating that tool. And what ends up happening is that there's less ownership, right? Like whenever there's a top-down decision that comes in, that's what typically happens. There's not enough uh, engagement. But what we see nowadays is different where the we see a, a bottoms up approach where the developer is coming in and saying, hey, we should definitely use this. This is going to improve our productivity. This is going to reduce costs. Management evaluates that decision to see if that's the, the best one. And this uh, ends up with way higher ownership uh, than before. And that difference is, is really substantial to the growth of developer first products. Now, let's talk about those different generations, right? I would say maybe the, the, the first generation started like around the, the 2000s. There's definitely products that came before that that were focused on developers, but let's uh, start from the, the year 2000 to 2009. Now, this first generation had some characteristics that are, they were really unique. Uh, adopting these tools uh, were like pretty uh, costly and those were those tools were seen as like oh this is a nice to have rather than like a necessity that hey if we don't have this it's like impossible we can build ourselves and these tools were nice because they enabled collaboration for the first time developers were no longer just like sitting on like uh, their their desks uh, alone building um, now this was a an effort that uh, more people were involved in general so tools like atlassian heroku cloudflare splunk dynatrace github obviously uh, mongodb twilio they really came in and, and changed the game in so many different ways now the second generation the, from 2010 to 2013, uh, this generation showed some different characteristics. They were focused on being really cost-effective and scalable because like internet companies were growing like crazy and they needed solutions to, to fit that model. They were API driven, which is also a very unique characteristic and they were mission critical. Now, having those tools were, was no longer uh, a nice to have. It was really like, we need this, uh, like we definitely need this. So tools like Algolia, 
uh, it started to emerge Auth0, Firebase, Datadog, DigitalOcean. So there are so many different angles that we see here. We see B2B SaaS tools like Sentry, Segment, and then we see other tools like Docker, like Plaid, uh, Stripe. These tools were really focused on enabling developers to, to build things faster. In this third generation from 2014 to 2017, it showed a new face to these developer first companies. They were now plug and play. So instead of like, let's say the, the API companies, instead of just offering a REST API, they were offering like SDKs for every single language. So it was way easier to plug. They were highly scalable, even more than, uh, than before. And they were extremely easy to integrate. Onboarding was easy. The go live was easy. Like everything around the integration aspect uh, was a self-serve experience rather than having to talk to sales or contact like the, the, get the enterprise plan or something like that. So we see API companies like Mux, uh, like Postman, like uh, Strappy. Uh, and we also see um, hosting companies like Netflify, Vercel, and, and so many others that came in during this time and showed this new face for these companies. Like Vercel specifically showed that design was no longer a nice to have. It was like a crucial aspect of the business. And every little tool uh, that we see here uh, demonstrated something different. And But what about the next generation? What about this upcoming generation of developer first products? What did they bring to the table? Definitely the, the ability for you to go to market faster. Uh, that's something that everyone wants like as an individual developer you want to launch your mvp as fast as possible or if you're working at a big enterprise company you also want to be able to ship products and and get them in front of users faster so this is a core um, identity of these products they also leverage low code or no code which is uh, crucial to enable non-technical folks to also uh, be able to help and they are enterprise ready from day one. So instead of like just following that bottoms up motion where you're adopting, like developers are adopting the tool and they're like using that and then eventually you start selling to the enterprise. Now this, this, this whole game has changed. Like you are able to be enterprise ready from day one. Now within those companies, we can see linear, we can see Raycast, we can see planet scale those companies they are able to build tools for developers for the individual developers but also to extremely large companies from day one and that's because they already leverage um, those enterprise ready apis which is what work os helps uh, by the way so how can we create developer happiness now this is a crucial aspect because these companies are investing on that specific persona but understanding how developers work is not something that uh, is intuitive for everybody but we need to try to reverse engineer how developers think and as a developer that's not a an easy job but um, it's important that we map those things and one of the, the characteristics that um, it's really clear when we talk about developer tools is this cognitive overload that we have. Well, let me talk to you about a personal experience, right? I moved to California seven years ago and I bought my first car. And as I was driving in LA uh, and I had to park my car eventually, like there were all these signs that were like, completely impossible to understand like it's so confusing and this gives me like a analysis paralysis uh, type of uh, behavior because I don't know what to do so I ended up not even parking because I don't know if like can I or, or can I uh, or I can't so the, there's this concept called the Hicks law that says that the time that it takes uh, to make a decision it, it increases with the number and complexity of these choices. 
So as we're building our products, we need to take that in consideration. The more options that we offer, uh, the more it's going to take for people to really understand that and digest that and make a decision. So we need to be extremely simple and, and put that on, on the forefront. If you go to Azure, for example, and you look to all the, the different products, and that's not only with Azure, AWS, GCP, like you're just like thrown with like tons of stuff like uh, on your face and now you have to, to figure out, okay, what should I do? What product should I use? Uh, there's so many overlap between them and you don't really know how to integrate um, everything. Um, same happens with the Heroku buttons. Uh, like that whole ecosystem grew so much where nowadays you have like 7,000 plus. So let's say I wanna deploy a ghost blog uh, this is an amazing developer experience because I can just click on one of those buttons and, and deploy. But if you have many of those, then it gets really hard to decide like, oh, which one should I use? Which one is the most um, used one, most popular or the, 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 the better maintained one? And the crucial thing about uh, developer happiness is the focus on the little things. So there's this theory called the broken window theory. And if you're not familiar, uh, this came from a, a former um, New York City mayor. And they, they said that obviously murder and graffiti, they're two vastly different crimes, but they are part of the same continuum. And a climate that tolerates one is more likely to tolerate the other. So. Yes, like those things are completely different and you should definitely treat them differently. But if you are like making exceptions um, and not really being on top of things, then um, you're gonna see, like you're gonna tolerate uh, bad things. So this, this theory basically uh, states that those visible signs of crime that happen in New York uh, on the 60s and 70s, uh, they would create more disorder. So in order to create an urban environment that uh, prevents that, they would like fix all the windows in the city instead of leaving them uh, broken. So and they saw that the numbers reduced in terms of crime and disorder because of that. So this is a really crazy theory and uh, it really applies to, to to software development in general, because if you think about it, as we're like just building software and we like, oh, like maybe I'll address this later. Maybe I'll fix this bug later. And you're now creating technical depth and all that. So um, this is the same for developer experience. Yeah, uh, Like we can definitely uh, just focus on the big things or we can look at every single interaction and evaluate. For example, the Sentry website you have like that classic cookie banner and you can just have like one of those, the, the yes or no, accept the, the cookie banner. But you see other companies like JetBrains where they do a much better job in terms of engaging with the user in that sense. So uh, JetBrains, they create this little uh, terminal that you can like accept or not. And you see those examples in other products too, like Firebase, when you go to their documentation, they not only have the copy to clipboard uh, or that classic thing, but they also have like a uh, theme uh, that you can choose and toggle, like a light and dark theme. As you navigate, they persist that change. Same with like when you change to Ruby to Python on the docs and you go to another page, they persist that, that option. So that's really cool. Um, another example is from the Mona Lisa font they give you all of these themes that you can choose. So it's not only about the light or dark, which uh, is uh, what you ex you would expect uh, from folks, uh, but they give you like the themes that developers are used to. In this case, Dracula, which is amazing. And uh, like you can choose and navigate on that website using that theme. Another example that I love is on the Plaid website. You can actually make a fake request and when you trigger that request they show you the response and you can navigate within the different objects on that response so that's 
really nice. Those small things, those real like little surprises that you give to users from time to time, it's what going to generate love, praise, and what's going to make the user want to promote and talk about it uh, with their friends. And the opposite side of that, when you have a documentation that has a typo, uh, you try the API, but there's like one param that is missing. Uh, you go to the dashboard and something's broken. Those small annoyances, they pile up. And the sum of those things is what creates distrust with developers or churn, uh, which can lead to like losing business or uh, maybe the worst of them is indifference. Uh, when you're building a brand, the worst thing that could happen to that brand is indifference. So it's extremely important that you focus on those little things to create that developer love instead of neglecting them, which will cause uh, these bad things to happen. Another interesting uh, topic is around the buyer and the user dilemma. This is a photo of me going to the dentist. And as a buyer, I knew that it was important to go to the dentist and I knew how crucial it is for my health to go. But as, as a user, I absolutely hate it. And there's nothing that I like about being there. Uh, but, you know, as an individual, I can make that decision and evaluate the trade-offs of that decision. And eventually I, I decided to go, even though there's all these bad things. Uh, but when you're talking about companies, you're talking about different people that are influencing the buying process or um, just use, using the product. You know, like when you're building something for others, sometimes the buyer is gonna be this CIO, the IT person, and the user is gonna be someone else, a developer, a designer, or whatever it is. And there's typically a difference in terms of what the buyer sees and what the user sees, what the buyer cares and what the, the user cares. Uh, there's this crazy story from the Los Angeles school district where they spent $1.3 billion on UI pads and curriculum and they after like doing some uh, some surveys they identified that like one out of 245 uh, one teacher out of 245 classrooms was actually using them and so that's a classic mistake where the buyer which is the school district thinks that this is a good idea but the users the teachers uh, they they don't really care about it now there's some companies that do a really good job mapping that buyer and user persona. I love the Prisma website where you have like all the, the little things that shows you like how this product works right away. You don't really have to scroll and you can already see code snippets. You can see the effect of those code snippets side by side. So just a, an amazing way of displaying the product. Uh, there are companies that are now more focused on the buyer persona, like HashiCorp, where you go to their website and everything is around like contact sales, read customer story, request demo. So the self-serve experience is, is more hidden and they're really targeting the CIOs, the CTOs and, and those sort of people. And you see that process with different companies, right? Like some companies, they approach this uh, their products with a sales-led strategy and a classic example is Jira uh, uh, so the there's so many like Jira is known uh, for uh, in the developer community that as a product that everybody likes to complain about Jira and it's extremely uh, I don't know slow and performance is not good for developers and they don't really enjoy the context switching between the code environment to this other tool. And there are other products that are more product-led, let's say Notion, where they really focused on the user or like linear, really focus on the user. And the users love the product because of that. So the, it's not that 
sales led and product led uh, like one is better than the other you always have to balance it's a dilemma where you need to somehow target one persona and give to that persona what they want and at the same time help the other and empower the other with the other things that they they want the other one and, and the other topic uh, related to how to build developer happiness is around adopting and integrating. Um, there's this um, really nice video from Bruce Lee, I love it, where he talks about uh, water in a glass. So I'll just play for you so, so you can check it out. I said, empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. So you have to be shapeless. You have to be like water when you're building developer products. Uh, you want to build products that are really integrated into the workflow of the developers. like. Uh, Stripe recently built this Visual Studio Code integration that is way more than just a simple extension. Uh, it allows you to trigger web hooks uh, from the the um, from your Visual Studio Code. It allows you to uh, they have like code snippets that you can use. So there's a lot of different things around this product that makes the life of someone who's integrating with Stripe easier, and so they don't have to leave their code editor to do it. Same with Superbase. I love how they give you the ability to generate types using TypeScript. Um, and they offer you a way to request everything with the open API spec. So as a product who is building a database for developers, uh, they know that, hey, it's important that they once they're integrating this to their code base, that they have strict types that they can leverage. It's important that they, if you're building an API, that we offer an API, uh, an open API spec for them to play play with. Off zero uh, also gives you uh, Postman collections, so they know that people are integrating with Postman as they are building their product. So all of these things are really important. And another. Uh, interesting concept. This is the, the Jacobs law. And it says that users will transfer the expectations they have built around one product uh, to similar products that they are using. So as you're building something, um, you might think, oh, I, I just need to focus on, on this piece over here and, and that's totally fine. But what happens in reality is that because people are using GitHub, because they're using Stripe, because they're using Twilio and they're seeing those integrations happening, they create the expectation that, hey, if I'm using another API product from another vendor, expect to have the same level or similar levels of uh, integration and support supportability. So that's really crucial when you're considering it. Once one player raises the bar, that bar is now set and everybody will need to catch up to that bar. And another aspect is open source, right? Being open source friendly, not only getting your code, pushing to GitHub and saying, that's it, uh, you know, it's open source. Uh, like, how can you be really like integrated into that community? How can you be answering tickets in a timely manner? How can you actually leverage that whole ecosystem to generate value, not only to you, but to others? A class example from, from this is Linux. Uh, it's actually like when Microsoft was talking about Linux in, the, in 2001, this is what Steve Ballmer, the, the CEO, uh, said back then. He, he said that Linux is a cancer that attaches itself in, in an intellectual property sense to everything that it touches. So this, this was an extremely... Uh, controversial uh, phrase that he that he taught and uh, that he said and like everybody was really surprised and really not not necessarily surprised but uh, it felt like 
oh, Microsoft will never be this company that was like close to the open source community. This was in the DNA of the company. But that's definitely not the case nowadays, right? Microsoft built VS Code, they acquired GitHub, they acquired uh, NPM. So now Microsoft, that company that used to say that Linux and open source was a cancer, now they they are uh, the ones responsible for the most popular code editor with more than uh, 14 million users. They own the biggest package manager uh, for open source uh, packages with 10, 10 million users. And they have like the largest community of developers with more than 40 million users. So you can see how having a strong open source presence changes the perception of, uh, of you as a company and in, in your products in, in the developers' minds. Another company that does a really good job of this is Vercel, where they support uh, things like, uh, they, they build things like Next.js, Hyper, and they also acquired other projects uh, like Turbo Repo and, and things like that. And they document, they show all that to you, like, hey, here, here's everything that we're doing around open source. Not only the big ones, but all these small packages with maybe like one, two, or three stars. This is as important as the big ones. And another aspect is treating docs as code. And we we look at docs and we we kind of have this attitude that is maybe not as important. Uh, but when we look at our code, we, we do all these sorts of things to make sure that it's good, right? So we lint our code, we create unit tests, we have CI and CD to make sure that everything is, is running and tested. We constantly fix technical depth around our, our code base and we build roadmaps to say that, hey, in the next two or, or, or three quarters, here's what we're gonna build. But we don't have we don't typically lint our docs. We don't typically create unit tests for our docs or have CI C D or even fix technical depth. Usually what happens you build the docs and you leave it there. Uh, we don't have roadmaps around like, hey, here's what we're gonna do in the next six months to improve the, this documentation, not only in terms of content, but in terms of docs as a platform. And there are so many tools that can help with that. Uh, obviously, you can use ESLint and configure the different uh, rules that you wanna have specifically for docs. Like one common mistake when you're doing um, like responses and you're showing like JSON objects is that you're not really like linting like for single quotes or double quotes, or if you're showing like JavaScript code examples, some people like trailing commas, others don't. So uh, you're gonna end up with these in inconsistencies if you have a big team maintaining this, uh, your documentation. So it's important that you lint so it feels like a unified um, message rather than like, oh, this thing, this Frankenstein type of thing. Uh, there are other packages like this write good package that can check for all the different um, like all the different errors that you made in, in your uh, text and can improve the way you're writing, not only identifying typos necessarily, but also improving the like just how you're uh, approaching like each uh, different phrase, like if you're using passive voice or not and stuff like that. Another one that is extremely important when it comes to docs is like docs is this place where you have many links that you're pointing out like inside the documentation to like different articles, but also to the outside. So to outside products or to the dashboard, let's say if you have one. So having a, a link check where you can go to every single hyperlink that you have, check for the ATP header and seeing like, oh, is this returning 200 or 404? And then you can uh, hook this up in your CI CD so you can test that all the links in your docs are still valid and still working. The crucial thing about this, regardless of how you're approaching, is to not see docs as something that is auxiliary to the product, but seeing docs as the product. Like documentation is the product and not necessarily an afterthought. So th that's the, the main message here. And 
Other one is obviously being data driven, right? Uh, we think that users are gonna do a certain thing and they end up doing something completely different uh, from what we're expecting. And the usually when we are designing solutions, there's like a planned path, desired path, and there's the actual behavior that the user does. And reconciling those things is extremely tricky. So we really need to understand how users are using this product from different angles. You can take an Quality, qualitative uh, data approach or a quantitative approach. And one is not better than the other. You need those two as you're making decisions. On the qualitative uh, side, you need to run feedback sessions one-on-one with people who are actually using uh, what you're building. Sometimes having group discussions with like a, a set of users is important and tracking that satisfaction over time is also important like this is a, a screenshot from uh, one of the the process that we used to run where we would map every single stage of the user how they were feeling on every single stage and then what was the satisfaction level as they were going through that experience and this just gives us some insights around like okay what can we improve on this particular one what are the opportunities what can we do better and then we would just show like every screen of the product. And then we ask them, hey, if you had to improve this, what do you, what would you do here? And we would give them like this fake money where they would say, oh, I would put like, so you have like a thousand fake dollars and now you're like prioritizing and helping the user prioritize. So this is really awesome. I think it, it works really well to not only get user insights, but also uh, help them prioritize. So you can take that knowledge and, and, and digest that with the team. Another one is having a advisory board that you can check every quarter to see how things are going. You can announce features uh, with only that uh, specific group and you can get feedback in a safe area. And it's really cool what you see when one customer is complaining about something, the other one has a similar experience and you put that all together. We used to like present uh, two roadmaps ahead of the products that we're building to this uh, to this group, so we could get feedback early on before we start actually building. And we would also track the satisfaction in in this dashboard. Like, hey, here's all the data that we that we got. Now let's display them and let's see how we're doing over time. Another interesting aspect uh, is the quantitative side, right? Uh, I think it's the other one is more around like research and talking to developers, understanding uh, how they're approaching the product. But with this is more like just looking at the numbers and uh, a good way to check are the support tickets that are coming in and trying to identify trends within uh, those numbers. Product usage, yeah, also extremely important. And one that people don't do as much is documentation usage. So with support, you can just look at the different products that you have and see, okay, like from all these tickets, like where are people complaining about? What are they really talking about? Like what, what can we improve? Uh, and you can see that maybe in one quarter, people are talking a lot about this one issue, but in the other one, uh, not necessarily. So this will give you a lot of insight on wh where to focus. They're, they're typically like paper cuts and quick wins that you can just extract from that and, and prioritize. Uh, we used to, to have a CLI and this was a dashboard that I created to visualize the different commands that we had within our CLI. So I, I could see every single like command that was being run uh, from users in an anonymous way. I could see the distribution of the version, even the operating system. So I can make a better decision around like what should we support and this gives you an understanding not only of like what is being most used but also what's least used and that's crucial because you can come in and say oh this command nobody's actually using the cli command let's try to understand why maybe we can remove that maybe that's a feature that we thought would be helpful but we ended up realizing that nobody really cares about it another example now related to the docs uh, so when I was building Dracula UI, 
one of the things I wanted to understand was like what were the code snippets were actually helpful for people. So I integrated with Segment and I tried to like like put that data in and display that in a dashboard to see, okay, this is the code block that people are touching more. These, this is the one they're, they're not necessarily using it. And this gives you a lot of insight about the languages, maybe if you, ha if you support multiple languages or multiple SDKs. So that's definitely a, a pretty interesting approach. And I would say the most important thing ab about all that uh, that I've talked about is being developer obsessed. Um, there's one documentary that I love. If you haven't watched, I highly recommend. It's called Jiro Dreams of Sushi. And it's this 85 uh, year old uh, sushi master where he talks about like the way he approaches work and it just shows like the behind the scenes of, of this uh, three Michelin star restaurant. And it's just like super insane. So I got a, a, a snippet that I, I want to play uh, to you just so you realize like how obsessed you can be when it comes to uh, to his craft, which is sushi. So we can take that to the to our craft, which is building products for developers. で、so it's insane right like we have this guy that has been like doing uh, uh sushi and serving sushi to people for more than like 70 years he started when he was like seven years old and still now he thinks that he hasn't achieved per per perfection right and that's the same approach that we need to have when we're building products for developers. We can definitely uh, have some like things that uh, work, but not necessarily are on that level of greatness that we want to achieve. Let's say with design, right? You go to the Braintree website, uh, which is an API for, for payment, and it looks good. It's okay. Uh, it's a website that works. It's a design that works. Uh, but how can we, you, we build a design that actually inspires people? You go to Stripe, uh, that's a design that inspires. That's why Stripe has like, there's so much love behind that brand because they're always pushing the bar. Um, same with a changelog, right? Something as simple as a changelog. You go to Algolia, their changelog works. You know, you have all the different changes over time. That's the format that you're expecting from a changelog and that's, totally okay the information is here that's fine but how can you build a change log that actually inspires you go to raycast linear they they do such a tremendous job in terms of like showing what changed they have different categories for what was fixed what was improved they have images that show that quality and show that love uh, for what they're doing recruiting too like you go to PayPal, another example, you see all the jobs and that's fine. That's great. All the jobs are there. You can apply. Here's the job description. Just like what you would expect from applying to a job. And that's totally fine. But how can you do recruiting that inspires? Uh, like Plaid, their competitor, one of the things that they do is that you can apply using an API. So how amazing is that? You as a developer, you can just you know, execute this post request um, using curl and there you have it, like you're applying to a job using it. So I think that's the core of everything, right? Like um, 
design is such a crucial piece. And as developers, we may, we may think like, oh no, they only care about the 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 like the actual thing that they are touching, but that's not necessarily true. Um, users they perceive a statically pleasing design as design that is more usable, and that's something we need to take in consideration when we are um, thinking about like uh, different needs of humans. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, Maslow he created this hierarchy of needs, and it talks about like the different needs that you need, you you have, right? Like there's the physiological need. Uh, safety if you don't feel safe like you can't really do anything then there's a feel of uh, belonging steam and self-actualization so these are the hierarchy of needs that he mapped uh, for humans and if we think about that from um, from another perspective uh, it's way different right like okay physiological food water sleep safety financial personal housing Belonging, it's about friends. Steam is about confidence. self actualization is about like peace and knowledge and innovation. You can't really get to innovation if you have like everything broken uh, as a foundation, right? And that's the same with developer products. Uh, if we try to create our own DX or DevX hierarchy of needs, uh, it starts with the functionality, right? Like you need RESTful APIs, you need a uh, standardized JSON response, you need an OAuth uh, integration so you can make authenticated requests, then we can start talking about things like re re reliability. We can start talking about uptime, latency, or like if you are SOC 2 compliant or ISO 27K compliant. Um, you can't really talk about like building uh, fun little Easter eggs if you're having downtime all the time so that's really important and then we can start talking about the usability of things okay how is our docs how is our sdks what about the demos that we're showing how is the change log and then you can start moving up and thinking about the extensibility should we create a cli should we offer a graphql layer should we have an open api spec available for everyone should we add web hooks on top of our rest api so whenever there's a real time update we can trigger those and then you can be more creative you can offer free merch you can offer like an API explorer or, or just anything you can go really crazy but it's really important that you approach this from a from the fundamentals rather than uh, than just like doing these little things that you think is going to cause impact but your foundation is broken and to be developer obsessed, uh, you can never really settle. If you're settled, uh, you're doing it wrong. And that's my message for you today. I hope this was uh, useful. And if you want to reach out, uh, I'm always on Twitter. I'm at Zina Rocha. And yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs>